Hi everyone, and thank you for joining the Rutgers Geology Museum's Ask a Geologist web series. So today we have uh, Dr. Ashutosh Goyal, who is an associate professor uh, in the Athi Rutgers University Material Science and Engineering Department. And today he will be speaking to us about turning nuclear waste into glass. So without further ado, um, Dr. Goyal, you may start. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for giving this opportunity to be here and interact with kids as well as the public. So, let me switch on the captions. Are the slides visible? Yes, they look good. All right, okay. So, as Ria just mentioned that uh, I'll be talking about turning nuclear waste into glass. And a bit about me, you know, I'm an associate professor at uh, School of Engineering, Department of Material Science and Engineering at Rutgers University. And uh, as you can see in this photograph, I have two naughty kids. And, you know, with my wife over there, we were, this picture, we took it at Niagara Falls. And, uh, I am actually a material scientist or a glass scientist, you may want to call it, because I work a lot with glasses. And my favorite glass is obsidian. Now, what is obsidian? It is a natural glass made by Mother Nature. It's a volcanic glass. It comes out in volcanic eruptions. When lava comes out and it cools down from a volcano, when, a lava, when lava comes out from a volcano and it cools down slowly, a lot of times you get a rock, which you think it's a rock, but it's actually a glass known as obsidian. And obsidian is so hard that in early times, human beings, they used to sharpen, use this obsidian, they used to make spears and other weapons out of it. Like they used to make knives out of obsidian. It's that hard of a glass. Now, Coming to today's topic about nuclear waste to glass, so let's get a bit of a background about it. Let's talk about nuclear energy. Look around you, you know, how many things do you see around you which run on electricity? Probably a lot, including your laptops on which you are probably sitting right now on your computers. Even for your mobile phones, you need electricity to charge or your tabs, you need electricity to charge. Have you ever thought, where does this electricity come from? In the United States, more than 20% of the electricity used comes from nuclear energy. All right. Now, what is nuclear energy? We'll come to that in a minute. But more, more than 20% of the electricity we use in the United States comes from actually nuclear energy. That's one aspect of it. Second aspect, we make weapons. United States has a lot of nuclear weapons. At one point, United States had more than 31,000 nuclear weapons. In today's date, we have 3,800 nuclear weapons. And pictures over here, the second picture in the, center, in the middle, little boy, that's an atomic bomb which, has, which was actually dropped. It's the picture of that atomic bomb. There is no bomb inside it, it's just a picture of a shell, but that's the real picture of the shell outside of the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima in Japan in 1945 to end World War II. And then the picture on the extreme right, that's another atomic bomb, Fat Man, which was actually dropped in Nagas on Nagasaki in, in 1945. So United States, in United States we have created a lot of nuclear weapons since World War II era, going into Cold War with USSR. And uh, until 1986, I suppose, or 87, we created a lot of nuclear weapons, a lot of atomic weapons. Okay. So again, that's again, a lot of nuclear power being used, nuclear reactors being used. And then let's talk about nuclear medicine. A lot of times we have to go through a procedure 
where we have to use some nuclear medicine or something nuclear actually goes into our body a lot of, for example if somebody needs god forbid but if anybody goes through if anybody gets cancer a lot of times the patient have to go through a therapy called radiation therapy what do they do in that radiation therapy they allow the body to be exposed they expose that uh, body part where the cancer is to high energy radiations to high energy light now that light or that radiation is so, so high energy that it kills the bad cells the cancer cells but it does not harm the good cells the healthy cells okay so that's one example of nuclear medicine we use in the united states we use a lot of nuclear medicine almost more than 15 million patients or 15 million procedures every year we go through nuclear medicine uh, involve nuclear medicine so again we use a lot of nuclear materials over here and all this nuclear medicine also comes from nuclear reactors right so now whether we create electricity using nuclear energy or we make bombs using to make nuclear weapons or we make nuclear medicine there is a price we pay for all these activities and what is that price that we pay whether we produce energy weapons or medicine in the end we generate nuclear waste okay what is nuclear waste everything in the world is made out of atoms atoms are really really small tiny tiny atoms right like you can't even see them with your naked eye if to see an atom for example you need to go through a really high resolution microscope we call it transmission electron microscope and that to very specialized transmission electron microscope to see an atom sometime so it's that tiny now everything in this world is made of atoms nuclear power gets generated when this atom it actually breaks into two it splits into two like this over here the green ball you see coming in it's actually called a neutron it's a particle that comes in and strikes into an atom and splits that atom into two when this atom splits into two a lot of energy is produced and that energy is actually used to produce electricity or to make bombs or you know whatever material we get from this we can use it as nuclear medicine just to give you an example all right so this is the process we create we perform to make nuclear energy now when you have this this is not done somewhere in your house or in some hospital or in some university or college there are special places for this we call nuclear reactors so this process of nuclear production of nuclear energy or an uh, at bombs or uh, medicine it actually takes place in a place called nuclear reactor okay it's a very specialized place very secret place nobody can enter over there it's a high high security region and now this nuclear reactors they do not cause any air pollution nuclear power plants do not cause any air pollution but whatever is left over once you are done with this process of creating all the energy and all the bombs and you have taken all the medicines from the nuclear reactor whatever is left inside the nuclear reactor is called nuclear waste all right now is nuclear waste dangerous think about it this way when you throw a paper somewhere in a dustbin and then that paper goes into a landfill right it takes about a month for the paper to decompose or to decay to rot when you eat an apple and you throw the apple core away it takes more than 6 months for the apple core to decay then you drink something in a plastic cup and you throw that plastic cup into garbage and that garbage uh, that cup now goes into a landfill it takes more than 500 years for that cup to decay when we produce nuclear waste 
after making all the nuclear weapons and all the nuclear medicines and all the electricity, the nuclear waste, whatever is left over, it can take thousands and even sometimes millions of years to decompose or to decay. And more than that, nuclear waste is radioactive. Now, what is radioactive material? Radioactive materials emit high energy radiation. All right. The energy produced by radioactive materials can kill cells. They can, it can cause cancer and a lot of other damage to living beings. We do not want to be exposed to any radioactive material. It's that dangerous. All right. So now think about how dangerous nuclear waste is. First of all, it takes thousands of millions of years to decay, to decompose. And then in those thousands and millions of years, it is emitting high energy radiation, which you don't want because it's highly, highly dangerous for you. For the living beings. Now, with that, where do we have nuclear waste in the United States? This is the map of the US, right? Now, in the Northwest, we have this state called Washington. If you look at the map of Washington, there's a county here named Benton, B E N T O N, Benton County. In this Benton County, there's a place called Hanford. Hanford site. This place actually has got 56 million gallons of radioactive waste, which is stored in 177 underground steel tanks. All right. Now, picture over here on the left, you will see that is from 1970s when these tanks were actually under construction. And they are huge. You can imagine 56 million gallons. Like the milk, the can of milk we get at our home is one gallon and we cannot keep more than five or six cans in our refrigerator. You have got 56 million such cans. Imagine how big, how huge these tanks will be that they have stored all this waste into 177 tanks. The second picture over here is the picture of Fat Man. Fat Man is not like a man who's fat. It's the name of bomb again which was dropped at Nagasaki. And the video I'm going to show over here is from the world's very first nuclear explosion called codename Trinity. This was, this happened in New Mexico in 1945. So at Hanford site, plutonium was extracted from the nuclear reactors to make the, to, to, to be for the, for the, for its usage in Trinity the world's first explosion and to develop fat man atomic bomb which was dropped on nagasaki so that's that's the importance of hanford site or that's why that's how we generated a lot of waste at hanford site because we made a lot of plutonium over there in the nuclear reactors to make nuclear bombs out of them, atomic weapons out of them and one of them unfortunately was also used was dropped on Japan in 1945. All right. Now, we generated all this waste. Now, we, we made all these nuclear weapons and we generated 56 million gallons of radioactive waste. Why did we even do that? What was the need? So, these two gentlemen over here, they are very famous scientists, uh, Dr. Zillard and Dr. Fermi, Enrico Fermi. These scientists were the ones who actually came up with the idea of nuclear reactors, that we can actually make nuclear reactors and we can actually control this and we can, make, we can control this process and make atomic weapons out of it. We can make electricity out of it. And it was a brilliant idea, right? But it happened in 1939 that they got scared. Why did they get scared? Now, to, to run a nuclear reactor, to make a, to produce electricity out of it, or to produce atomic bomb out of it, atomic weapons out of it, you need an element called uranium. At that time, in 1930s, most of the uranium around the world was supplied by only two countries. One was Canada, and second was Czechoslovakia. And, and today, it is, there are two different countries, Czech Republic and Slovakia. At that time, it was only one, Czechoslovakia. And Czechoslovakia in 1930s was under German rule. Germany was ruling Czechoslovakia. So all the uranium mines in Czechoslovakia 
were under the occupation of Germany, under the control of Germany. And all of a sudden, Germany stopped selling uranium from Czechoslovakia to anybody else in the world. They stopped selling uranium. So that actually gave these two scientists goosebumps. They got scared, thinking that did Germany somehow get an idea of our research, what we did in the United States? Are they going to replicate our research and make an atomic weapon out of it, atomic bomb out of it, which may which they may use against us? That actually scared them, and they went to Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was a professor at Princeton University at that time. It, they came to Albert Einstein and they convinced him that uh, Dr. Einstein, look, Germany is actually trying to steal our research and try to replicate our research to create an atomic weapon out of it. If that happens, they can use it against us. We need to do something quickly. At that time, Dr. Einstein, Albert Einstein actually, so Dr. Enrico Fermi wrote a letter for Albert Einstein and Albert Einstein just signed it. He, he literally just signed it. He didn't write the letter. And that letter was actually named to or meant for President Roosevelt at that time, where they convinced President Roosevelt that this is what's going on. And if US does not start making its own atomic weapons now, Germany may develop them before us and they may bomb us. So let's do it now. And that's what actually led to the start of the famous Manhattan Project, where nuclear reactors were built up at Hanford site in Washington state and plutonium extraction got started and we started making nuclear weapons. Guess what? Germany could never make an atomic weapon. Germany failed in their research, they tried, but they failed. And they could never make an atomic weapon, whereas in the US, we, the scientists made an atomic weapon and they not only made it, they used it against Japan in World War II. In the end, Albert Einstein actually said that had I known that Germans would not succeed in producing an atomic bomb, I would have never lifted a finger. He regretted his decision of signing this letter, but the damage was made. The damage was done. So now we have all this nuclear waste in today's date, right? Coming to the present scenario, we have all these 56 million gallons of radioactive waste sitting at Hanford site in Washington. Now, can we leave this nuclear waste in tanks forever? They, it has been sitting over there since 1945, since the start of World War II, or the end of World War II. And, you know, we are in 2020 now. Can't we leave it just like that? I don't think so, you know. At least as a scientist myself, I do not want to leave it for my next generation, for our next generation, for our children. We don't want that. What do we do now? A lot of times when I give such presentations, children ask me a question. Can we shoot nuclear waste into sun or space somewhere? It's a great idea. But imagine this. You know, every time we launch a rocket to, towards a space or to any planet, a lot of times we end up in failures where something goes wrong and the rocket launch fails, right? Even 0.1% failure in the rocket launch means even one out of 1,000 rockets we launch will have 56,000 gallons of radioactive waste spilled all over the Earth. 0.1% failure in the rocket launch will have 56,000 gallons of waste spilled all over the Earth, and this waste is radioactive. We cannot take a chance. Again, what do we do now? Let's turn this waste into glass. That's what scientists came up with, this brilliant idea, terrific idea. Let's turn this waste into glass. And why glass? First of all, glass has a very flexible structure. At atomic level, when you talk about the how the atoms are actually located in the glass, how they sit in the glass structure, it's pretty flexible. Glass has is such a beautiful material, it can absorb anything in its structure and it does not complain, right? That's one. So we tend to exploit the good nature of glass that it, it won't complain, it won't say us anything, let's put anything into it, right? That's one. Second, glass is very durable. Look at your windows around you right you must your house must have been like what 
maybe 30, 40 years old. How many times have you actually replaced windows in your house? You know, maybe once, twice, but that too, not because glass went bad, something else probably would have changed, right? Glass can actually stay for hundreds and thousands of years. And then as scientists, we can design glasses which can actually stay intact for tens of thousands of years. Look at all the geological glasses. Look at how Mother Nature produces glass. All those obsidian, for example, obsidian has been there forever, right? If you go to Europe, you will see all those cathedrals or you know hill forts in Sweden. You'll see natural glass around everywhere, which is thousands of years old and it's still intact. So glass is that durable. That's why scientists chose glass as the material. Now we are not going to put waste into glass. We are make, going to make waste. Uh, we are make, going to make glass out of waste. We are not using glass as a bottle where you you take a bottle, you put the waste into it, and you seal it up. No, we are going to make glass out of waste. How do we make glass? Well, we learned it from Mother Nature, and I'll just show you a video over here. Take a look. In this video, some geologists are actually trying to use the lava and find out what happens to the rock when it collides with the In this video, some geologists are doing an experiment where they have taken, I don't know, how many hundreds of pounds of rock, rocks, and they are going to melt these rocks in a furnace and pour it into water. Right? That's how Mother Nature produces. Like that's how volcanoes erupt and that's how Mother Nature produces glass. Then the lava comes out of the volcano. Imagine Hawaii. If you go to Hawaii, you are at, on the border at the at Pacific, right? There are volcanoes just next to Pacific sitting over there. And volcanoes erupt all the time there. And lava goes into Pacific Ocean. As soon as it touches water in the Pacific Ocean, it cools down so quickly, it freezes down so quickly that it turns into glass. All right, take a look. Today, Jeff and Robert will use the lava oven to find out what happens to liquid rock when it collides with liquid water. They begin by melting 800 pounds of basalt rock. Start out as quarter inch gravel, and when we see it later and dump it out, it'll be lava that pours out at a, somewhere between 2050 to 2100 degrees Fahrenheit, just as it does in nature. There's no difference. When I'm working, when I have leathers on, I'm up there working with lava. It is an amazing feeling. Just before the lava tips out of the furnace is just really a, an, an exciting and pregnant moment. Fabulous convection in there. I'm constantly seduced by the intensity of the orange. And even as it's cooling, the thing still moves. It breathes. It inflates. It finds some limit. It deflates as it breaks out. It'll do this over and over and over. But today, they see something unusual. Almost every flow that we do. I can tell you 90% of what's going to happen. Today, I was caught off guard. Our look experiment today illustrates how rapidly heat can be transferred from lava and for that water to be transformed to steam. Of course, as steam is produced, the water molecules spread out at a space that takes up a thousand more times space than in water. As it does so, energy is released. The pressure released during drilling could cause water running deep underground to rapidly boil and expand. Not even rock can contain the explosive expansion of water flash boiled by magma. The escaping gas would rip to the surface in a man-made phreatomagmatic eruption. Right, so that's how actually Mother Nature produces glass, and that's where we learned it from. That's where all the scientists and engineers learned how to make glass. And now, 
how did we adapt this to our laboratory to how do we make glass in our lab like right now when i'm talking to you guys my students at rutgers university are actually making glass after this presentation i am going to go to my office to my lab and see you know what did they do and uh, i want to see over there whether they made a good glass or not from the, from a different composition whatever they are using for their research but take a look how do we make how do we make glasses in the lab Team shot now, buddy. Go over and stand. Scott, keep standing. Keep zooming in. Good job, team. And with that, you know, so the same procedure, kind of a same process, will be used by the scientists and engineers at Hanford site in Washington. They are the federal government is actually building up. A facility called Wave Treatment Plant at Hanford site in Washington. The Wave Treatment Facility is as big as 50 soccer fields or even 50 more than 50 soccer fields combined. The cost of building this plant has exceeded 17 billion dollars, and we expect the process of converting this to start this process of converting nuclear waste to glass by 2022. Will it be? Is it worth making doing this job? All this expenditure and everything? Absolutely. Will it be easy? No. A lot of scientists and engineers are actually working hard to solve a lot of scientific problems so that we can do this, we can make this process as smooth as possible, and all this problem can be solved in a given amount of time. All right. With that, thank you very much, and I'll take any questions you have. May I stop sharing the presentation? Yes, you can stop sharing your screen and then you can open up the, the document. All the questions are there. Okay. Uh, let's see the question. Okay, so we have a question here from Mary from Scotch Plains, New Jersey. 
if glass is a really really slow moving liquid will the nuclear wave eventually migrate downhill that's a very good question uh, i hear this a lot of times can, can you see me can you see my video yes we can see you okay so i i hear this a lot of times that you know glass is liquid and it flows over time it's a misconception to start with so a lot of times and and i teach this you know when i discuss with my students that uh, a lot of times you go to old cathedrals in europe and the tour guides over there will tell you oh glass is a super cool liquid and it flows and that's why the bottom of those windows are actually thicker at thicker at the, the windows in the cathedrals are thicker at the bottom because glass flow glass flows over time and over thousands of years hundreds and thousands of years glass has sagged no that's incorrect there has been research done uh, by a professor from brazil his name is professor edgar zanotto and he has actually shown that in his research that for even your window glass normal window glass to flow over time just to flow 1 cm right at room temperature or whatever conditions it works under it will take more than human existence on this earth it will take probably you know millions of years for a glass to flow even 1 cm so now don't worry about that the glass is not going anywhere it won't flow down there all right now uh, another question we have here is again from mary it is that is fiberglass also used to capture nuclear waste no we don't use fiberglass to capture nuclear waste fiberglass is a different uh, different thing it's a completely different product all right then let's move on to some other questions and mary i'll come back to you if we have more time uh, ria's mom would like to know what phase is nuclear waste at room temperature solid or liquid well you know if i can show you a tank over here like you know a cut out of a tank over here i have one cartoon in one of my presentations i did not put it here but it is kind of a heterogeneous mixture where at the top Im imagine something like for example when you put uh, soil in water right now you have got water at the top soil sits at the bottom and then there is something muddy in between so think of the so think of nuclear waste in the same way you have got liquid at the top a lot of heavy stuff have, has actually settled down in the tanks so it's it's a whole mixture like there is a whole lot of sludge at the bottom which is really thick you have to scrape it off so it's a whole lot in you know it, it's a heterogeneous thing there is no homogeneous solid or liquid thing you have both solid and liquid phases in it all right uh then we have pat pat says i heard that the salt dome storage idea has been discarded because we discovered their leak is that correct uh i'm sorry pat i don't know an answer to this question i know that yes this was an idea salt dome storage now whether it has been discarded or not i'm not aware of it honestly i'm sorry okay how long does it take for the glass to make in the lab well you know it takes a few hours but you have to start the process a day earlier so basically you have to keep you have to make mix the chemicals and then you have to keep them in a furnace so that all and heat them at a particular temperature so that all the gases can go out of it and then the next day you go in and you keep that mixture of chemicals in a crucible in a cup for example a, cer a ceramic cup or a platinum cup we use a lot of times in the research we use platinum crucibles or platinum cups you may understand it so because platinum does not actually add impurity to the glass so and then you heat it up depending on the temperature you want to so a lot of times so for example today if you come to my lab today i let's say around 3 or 4 pm my students are going to melt a glass at around 1675 degree c not fahrenheit degree celsius so you can imagine it's like around 3000 degrees fahrenheit and it will take them several hours so probably they would have started today morning that's why they'll pour out a glass today at 4 pm around 4 pm okay 
Uh, then it is what safety precautions do you use in the lab to protect the students? Well, as you must have seen in the video, the, the guy, the gentleman who was actually pouring the glass out from the furnace, he was completely packed in a suit. That's high temperature resistant suit, fire resistant suit. And you have to wear glasses and you have to wear a face shield to protect yourself. So yeah, we take all the kinds of precaution and you have high, you know, high heat resistant gloves, like double layer of gloves, first layer, a closed gloves, a closed gloves, and then you have a heat resistant big gloves on it. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of uh, personal protective equipment in there. But then again, it is dangerous to melt glass and we do not allow anybody just, you know, like somebody walking from, from outside and, hey, you know, I want to melt glass. No, that's not possible. You have to go through proper training. So only people who have been trained to do that can only do that. And just to let you know, guys, here that if anybody, like every year on Rutgers Day, unfortunately, this year we couldn't do that because of COVID-19, but almost every year in the month of Mar uh, end of March or beginning April, we have a Rutgers Day where in our department, in my lab, we open our lab to different people, like you know, to, to the public, and we actually show you glass melting there live. Okay. After the waste is turned into glass, where is it stored? Ah, so the, when the waste is turned into glass, it actually is, the, when the waste comes out of the, when the glass actually, glass melt, comes out of the melter, it actually goes into a steel canister. I don't have a picture of a steel canister here. I have presentations other than, you know, this one, and due to the paucity of time, I don't know, I don't know if I'll be able to show them to you or not, but, you know, there are big, huge steel canisters in which that melt is actually poured directly and it is stored in those steel canisters. Now, those steel canisters are stored in a geological repository or are supposed to be stored in a geological repository. When I say geological repository means somewhere in either in rocks or in desert, like the last geological repository was, that was decided by U.S. federal government was uh, Yucca Mountains in Nevada. But then, you know, it's a lot more political question than a scientific question where it will be. And, you know, like President uh, Bush said it will be Nevada. President Trump, uh, President uh, Obama came in. He didn't say, he, he said, like, I don't like Nevada. No, no, no. He, they cannot go into Yucca Mountains there. It's not a good thing. President Trump came in. He had a different view to it. So it, it's a lot more political than scientific. All right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, what made you to decide to work with glass? Uh, I can actually share a link with you over here if you allow me. And uh, that will actually help you answer this question. Give me one second. Whosoever has asked this question, I'll share a link with you in the chat box. Or uh, Ria, can I do that? Yeah. Yes, you can just uh, share with everyone. Here's a link because the same question was asked to me uh, in an interview. So just click on this link and you'll find the answer to this question. Okay, it's a long story, but I hope it will give you an idea. And then I'll be more than happy to answer any further questions. All right. Uh, I heard scientists were thinking about putting the waste into a subduction zone. Would that be a good idea? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, waste is actually supposed to be immobilized into glass. That's what I can say you right now. Other than that, I won't be able to answer exactly. You know, I don't want to express anything out of my opinion. Uh, I, I hope you understand. All right. So then we have Ria's mom says, how do you know which dimensions to make the glass to contain the nuclear waste? Well, it's not about the dimensions of the glass. So as I said, you know, the waste is actually converted into glass melt. And then that melt is stored in huge steel canisters. Right. And then those steel canisters have actually specified dimensions. And those dimensions of the steel canisters are actually based on the kind of waste stored in it. So 
it's a lot it's a more technical than that and you know we can have a separate discussion about it and i can show you pictures of different canisters being used in different countries actually what kind of canisters is us going to use what kind of canisters french use for their waste why do they do that why do why are we doing this it's a lot more technical but yeah you know it, it's not about the dimension of glass to answer your question it's about the dimension of the steel canisters in which the glass will be stored okay then again let's go back to mary where it is what is the difference between a glass and a ceramic for holding nuclear waste well a glass is an amorphous material i don't know you know your background so i'm sorry if i'm using this as a technical term but there are two kinds of materials one is amorphous one is crystalline glass is amorphous in nature in other words its structure at the atoms in the glass is are all have you know randomly uh, oriented or they sit randomly in the structure there is a crystal the atoms are periodic they repeat the pattern so due to in in the ceramic you do not have that flexibility to break that periodicity because it's a crystalline material you have to have that periodicity otherwise that ceramic structure will break at the atomic level it will break down and then you won't be able to have that nuclear waste into it so yes ceramics are used i won't say that ceramics are not at all used to contain nuclear waste ceramics are used to contain a spe some special types of nuclear waste but their loading like how much waste you can actually put into ceramic is much less in comparison to how much waste you can put into a glass and that have to do because of the periodicity of ceramic versus a periodicity of glass okay uh does the nuclear waste change the chemistry or properties of the glass like make it less fragile it no it it does not have anything to do like that i can imagine you must be probably thinking about that okay you know it's a nuclear waste it's radioactive it's emitting radiations and that's probably is making the glass fragile or you know more and more more fragile or less fragile the radiations that come out of the radioactive waste yes they have an impact on the structure of glass but it's not huge so when you're talking about thousands of years or tens of thousands of years that uh, impact is minuscule all right then you have can you melt and remelt nuclear glass like recycling glass bottles well i don't know why would you like to do that because when you're dealing with something radioactive you want a single shot thing so that you don't have to deal with it again you want minimum number of steps you can have in the process so can you do that theoretically yes do you want to do that no you don't want to expose yourself again and again to something radioactive and imagine this you know you just use one melter in which you melted this all this waste converted this waste into glass now that melter in itself is a nuclear waste because all the melt on the walls of the melter you still have the glass sticking to it you cannot remove it so now that we also have to dispose that melter off so the number of times you remelt and recycle this glass you are actually adding up number of melters you are creating more and more waste now to deal with all right uh of all the different types of nuclear waste can all of them be put into glass like medical waste or plutonium waste no not really so i'll just give you an example uh like for example there was a few years back there was uh when tsunami came in into japan and there was a big disaster it went into the nuclear reactor in japan fukushima disaster fukushima you must have you must have heard or at least in news a lot of radioactive waste actually leaked out into pacific ocean a lot of that waste contained iodine in it iodine is a gas but it's it's an it's an element in the periodic table but it's it's a gas now you cannot and you cannot put that gas into the glass right so that's where ceramic come into picture what scientists do or what engineers do when they are melting this waste to glass when they are converting this waste to glass a 
upon heat treatment iodine for example and then i'm just giving you one example we have more such you know notorious radioactive species iodine is just one example iodine tends to leave this melt it volatilizes from the melt from the glass melt so to capture that volatilized gas on the melt they have got something uh, on the top of the crucible they have got on the top of the melt they have got something a bed called scrubber it's a porous bed called scrubber it contains soda in it let's say you know uh, alkali or what do you call uh, sodium hydroxide in it now uh, what is sodium so for example you know uh, something that you use to if if you ever get hair stuck in the bathroom you know in the drain you put a liquid in it right you can get it from home depot called lye that's potassium hydroxide so imagine you have that lye over there potassium hydroxide over there or sodium hydroxide over there and iodine when it volatilizes from the melter it goes into that scrubber into that porous bed it reacts with sodium from sodium hydroxide and forms a chemical called sodium iodide now that sodium iodide is solid now you can extract it and put it into a ceramic that's how so as i said earlier you know yes ceramics are used everything does not go into glass but for some special waste and this is one example for that the iodine why i why did i pick up iodine it's one of the most notorious radioactive elements iodine 129 it's an isotope radioactive isotope of iodine it has half life of i don't know how many millions of years probably 1 million years or 15 million years something like that or 1.5 million years one two it is water soluble so if it enters into the ground water it's a problem right so we need to take care of all these things would you use the nuclear glass like you use other glass in telecom or outer space well yes and my i have actually worked in industry and my experience has been in optical fiber industry so optical fiber is something which is used to transmit all the internet signals and phone signals your all your 4g 5g 3g it all goes through optical fibers and optical fiber is made out of glass so yes glass is used in telecom and outer space now do we use nuclear glass not at all no it's radioactive we can't right with that uh, anything else that i didn't answer Yeah. I think there's one more question. It says are there any other major nuclear waste sites in the US besides the Hanford site? Yes, there are. Uh one is in South Carolina. It's called Savannah River. So there is in South Carolina we have Savannah River. You know, wherever they built reactors, they wanted a lot of water. So the re the nuclear reactors were actually built they they took care of two things. One the place have to be deserted nobody lives around there two they should have a continuous supply of water because the nuclear reactors will when they start operating they'll produce a lot of heat so they have to cool down that keep that nuclear reactors cold so that the temperature doesn't exceed a certain limit otherwise it will blast off right so savanna river site in south carolina hanford site Hand Hanford site has Columbia River flowing over there, so Columbia River water was used. So yes, the other site we have right now where the glass is actually being made is Savannah River site in South Carolina. And then we had before that in New York there was something called Defense Waste Processing. No, uh, Defense Waste Processing Facility is yes, which where the glass has already been made and the facility is closed now. It's no more operational since I think 1980s. I don't remember exactly which year, but yes, uh, yes. So we have different sites in the US. Uh, then, is that why taking iodine tablets is the first response to an exposure to radiation? No, 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 no. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. There must be some other reason to it, but no, iodine does not absorb radiation. No, nothing of that sort. If if you are exposed to radiation, iodine. I, I I'm not sure about that, but yes, iodine does not absorb radiation. Okay. Yes, it was to protect thyroid. But you your question is, if you are exposed to radiation, 
I'm not sure about that. I don't think so. That's the case. Iodine protects you from thyroid. Yes. There's a special, uh, there's a disease called goiter. Iodine protects you from that problem. It's a thyroid problem. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Goyle. I think you have answered all of the questions we had today. Um, and thank you to our audience who came um, to listen today. Um, and I just wanted to announce that for our next uh, next Ask a Geologist, we have on Friday, December 4th at 1 p.m., we will have Sophia Hudzik, uh, who is a project assistant at Montclair State University. And she will be speaking about digging into archaeology. Um, so don't forget to tune in on Friday, December 4th at 1 p.m. And once again, thank you so much, Dr. Goyle, for uh, giving us your time. And um, I hope the glass turns out well today. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It was a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.